I've been playing outdoors since I was a kid, standing by the front door at around two years old, hollering, side, 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 trying to get my mom to let me go play outside. Now, after 30 plus years working in the outdoor business, I'm dropping insider conversations every week with the brand leaders, guides, marketers, CEOs, and others to make the outdoor industry a trillion dollar juggernaut that drives product innovation, revenue, and public policy for everything outdoors. I'm Rick Says. Welcome to the Outdoor Biz Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 433 of the Outdoor Biz Podcast with outdoor writer and podcaster Meg Carney. Meg is an outdoor and environmental writer with a passion for environmental advocacy. She primarily covers topics within the outdoor industry ranging from the best new products and greenwashing to scientific cover-ups of hazardous chemicals. And if you're not listening to her series on Forever Chemicals released on March 4th, get on that. It's a must-listen. Meg is dropping new episodes of that series every Monday through April. Welcome to the show, Meg. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, great to uh, talk to another podcaster. I always enjoy that. always learn some new tips, and and uh, it's always fun. Absolutely. So tell us how you became an outdoor lover and environmentalist. Well, I think it happened like it did for most people, kind of as a kid. I spent a lot of time outside, but I guess the unique thing about my upbringing is – my grandfather was a conservationist, and we lived with him on his 400-acre farm on the prairie in Minnesota for cool. a lot of my childhood. And so a lot of time, I was allowed to just kind of like free roam around the farm. And also, my grandpa was obviously <laughs> really <laughs> big into environmentalism and yeah. conservation and sportsmanship and stuff. And so I learned a lot of things from him and just kind of like how to interact with the environment and why it's important to have it be like a part of your life and like respecting the animals and the plants and everything that they have to offer. Yeah. And I would say like my parents kind of like continued to encourage that behavior because they would always, I don't remember what they're called, but they're like the Nat Geo kids and the Jane Goodall kids oh, books yeah, and all yeah. that yeah. stuff. So yeah. <laughs> they were like, obviously this is an interest of hers. And so they kind of helped uh, move the needle in terms of environmentalism and a, a growing interest in conservation and ecology. And then as an adult, I just continued that interest. It was just a part of everything that I did. Hmm. And it started when I was little. That's like a master's degree in environmentalism with a, a, the, <laughs> you know, fa- grandfather and parents like that, I'll bet. That must have been fantastic. And as a kid, yeah, you get to play in the dirt and get all the bugs and all the things you want to do anyway, right? Oh, absolutely. And the farm that my brother and I spent a lot of time on when we were kids is uh, really nice because there were like a couple of fields that people would think of a traditional like tilled farm, Mm. but most of it is an easement for conservation. And so Mm. it's just like wild prairie and there's a stream that runs through it. So there's tons of wildlife, like depending on the time of year, you'll see turkeys or white-tailed deer Wow. Like fox, beavers, really anything. <laughs> God, <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, growing up in the wilderness, that's fantastic. What did what did he do for for work? What do I do? No, what did your grandfather do for work? Oh, he was a farmer and conservationist. Okay, so that was his job. So yeah, perfect. Yeah, wow, very cool. Mm-hmm. And how did you become a writer? That also started pretty young. So when we moved off of the farm, my parents opened a bookstore that was connected to our house. So when I wasn't playing outside, I was kind of surrounded by books and writing. And both my parents are pretty like artistic and proficient writers Mm -hmm. in different capacities. And so I don't know, I remember journal and like writing all the time as a kid, whatever I wanted, like coming up with stories and then I kind of just latched onto that through school um, and Mm. university. You probably won all the competitions at school and university, right? (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean, I never really entered into writing competitions of any kind, but Uh, I should have tried. (laughs) Yeah. What was the first thing you wrote for publication? That would have been in university. It was uh, like a short story that was published in a short story like book, Mm -hmm. like a compilation of short stories. And that came out probably in 2012. I don't know. It was a long time ago. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, right. But that was like the very first thing that was ever like 
published with my name on it and went out to the public. And then it took a while after university to like, for me to get back into writing. Hmm. I took kind of a break to do pursue other things like guiding and outdoor activities and things like that. And then I realized that I missed writing. And so I kind of got back into it and then started freelance writing. And I don't remember the first article that was published at all. I don't even remember what it's about. <laughs> well, there's so many, right? <laughs> yeah. It was probably for a really like small, unknown website because you have to build up your portfolio somehow, right, you know? Right. Yeah. Write a bunch of stuff. So tell us about your first book, Outdoor Minimalist, Waste Less, Hike- Waste Less Hiking, Camping, and Backpacking. S- That sounds pretty cool. What was the inspiration for that? Um, Yeah, so it kind of has a lot to do with my background. Mm -hmm. Like I explained, like the way that I grew up and the things that influenced me as a child. But also I worked in the outdoor industry for all through university and then after university in multiple capacities, like Mm -hmm. largely in the rock climbing industry, but outside of that as well. Mm -hmm. And as I got more into outdoor sports as an adult and worked and saw things happening in the industry, I just kind of felt like there was a lot of waste happening. Yeah. Somebody and... needs to show these people something. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to find a way to kind of like merge those interests of like outdoor recreation and environmentalism, mm-hmm. conservation, those types of things. And so This was an idea that actually, so the book is published through Roman and Littlefield, which owns Falcon Guides. Um, So if you get like those yellow and black hiking books, that's Falcon Guides. Mm -hmm. And they were looking for someone to write a zero waste backpacking guide. And Mm -hmm. I didn't really love that idea because zero waste, first of all, I'm not zero waste. So I was like, I I don't think I can write a guide on how to be zero waste when I'm not zero waste. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that seems wrong. Yeah. And so I pitched this idea instead and I really liked it. They felt like it was more approachable and could apply to a wider audience. So that's kind of like where the inspiration for that came. It mm-hmm. was not my like first idea for a book. Like when oh, okay. I talked to Falcon Guides about it, I was actually writing a different book that I still haven't finished. Mm-hmm. Um and I was like, well, I guess I'll roll with this one and see what happens. Um, yeah, give them what they and, want first and then give them what you have. <laughs> yeah, because I hadn't published a book yet. And so okay. it seemed like a good opportunity to get my first book published right. through a publisher under my belt and learn that process and what it all meant. And I don't know. It's been good so far. <laughs> and can you share with us the book you're working on or is that still under wraps? Oh, I don't know if I'm going to finish it anymore, so <laughs> okay. I, I probably won't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, what was, what was the topic? The topic was actually speciesism, which is, I'm vegan. Mm-hmm. So speciesism is basically the way that we view different species of animals, where like we'll put one on a pedestal and mm-hmm. not the other one. So kind of the best comparison is like dogs and pigs. Like <laughs> we treat dogs as if they are human children and then pigs we kind of just i mean we treat them like livestock because that's what they are to us and um, even though they have a similar level of intelligence and all of this stuff so it was about that but it was more of a fictional narrative interesting sounds like an interesting book i was thinking dogs and snails there's a lot of snails in my yard i don't know why but as a kid yeah snails these little little tiny snails they were about maybe an inch big they had a little shell on them and they're just you know be cold wet weather and they'd be everywhere all of a sudden it's like where where are these guys coming from it's weird <laughs> yeah i, I never, love snails they're so beautiful yeah they're they had a pretty shell but you know as a kid we'd play with them we'd pick them up and put them on the side of the wall and watch them stick or you know stick and crawl up the wall or whatever but i never i have to look into that figure out where, why they were there that's weird so you did the writing what inspired the outdoor minimal minimalist podcast yeah, so kind of a natural progression, I, obviously. <laughs> it feels natural in retrospect, but it wasn't oh, okay. um, for me personally. So I wrote Outdoor Minimalist kind of during the height of COVID. Mm-hmm. And it was actually really perfect timing for me because I had moved back to Minnesota and was really isolated and I had a lot of time. Like I didn't have a like a community or anything. So it was good to focus on writing. But then when the writing was done, I was like COVID was over and I started traveling in Oregon. Mm-hmm. 
And I was like, well, what am I supposed to do <laughs> with all this time? <laughs> right. I was like, I can work on other writing projects, but I also should probably market the book. And like working with a publisher was really beneficial in a lot of ways, but also it's somewhat limiting. So mm. like the topic of the book is very tailored to consumers, like a consumer mm -hmm. handbook. Yep. Uh, this is the things you should look for, how to avoid greenwashing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't like a larger industry discussion, which I really wanted to include like information for producers and like mm -hmm. how companies can really play a role in minimizing their environmental impact as the ind outdoor industry as a whole. Right. And I was talking to my brother about that and he was like, well, you should just start a podcast and like interview people about that topic. And really? I was like, that sounds crazy. That's <laughs> really, wow, really. <laughs> yeah. I just, it's not really my personality. I think if you heard the podcast, it, I, I mean, you might be able to tell, but I'm a very introverted person. I don't really like a lot of social interaction mm -hmm. very much like drains me. And so I was like, I don't know if I can put myself out there mm -hmm. in that capacity, but I was like, I might as well try. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then it turns out that I really enjoy that media. <laughs> yeah. Podcasts are perfect for that. I think, I mean, I think it's a way yeah. for folks that, cause I'm, you know, I, I get pretty gregarious around people I know, close friends and things like that. But when you first meet me, you probably think I'm, Here's this guy. He's kind of quiet. He's kind of, you know, I'm not, I'm more of an introvert than extrovert, which is often mm -hmm. a sales guy. But the podcast, <laughs> I think you're right. It's just perfect for those of us that don't like to just jump in the middle of the fray, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's kind of structured and planned in some capacity. And it also allowed me to expand on the ideas mm -hmm. that I really wanted to share, but wasn't really allowed to expand on in the book. Right. And also as a bit of an accessibility piece. So, like for folks that don't really like reading mm -hmm. or they have dyslexia or something like that, like mm -hmm. this was a way that they could like access that information yeah. um, without having to read it. Good idea. And how many episodes are you on now? Oh gosh, I don't know. I think at the time of this recording, we have a 25. Nice. Good for you. Yeah. And when does it uh, publish? It like monthly or what's your schedule? Just whenever you get the um, topic? <laughs> our cadence is every monday so every monday okay. we have a new episode so it's a weekly cadence uh -huh. Uh -huh. and you interview outdoor industry and sustainability experts are there any mm -hmm. topics or solutions or issues they've talked about that kind of surprise you kind of like oh i didn't think of that one i don't know i feel like i learned something new from every person that comes mm -hmm. on my podcast there's mm -hmm. such diversity from the people because they'll be conservationists or other writers or people that work in product design and those types of things. So I'm not sure if there's anything that like explicitly shocked me mm -hmm, about yes. anything, but yeah. there is one episode that always sticks out to me and it was with the author and ecologist Robert, uh, Robin Lee Carlson. And she wrote a book on a wildfire that was in California mm. And she basically cataloged what happened ecologically after the fire was done. So like how long it took the land to wow. store itself and all this stuff. And I don't know, it was just like an interesting take on wildfires that I hadn't heard before, looking at it in more of a positive light and a, a way that like helps the land to kind of regenerate. Yeah, it's funny living out here in the West. We, I was, I taught at a sixth grade camp right out of college for a few years and it was at Palomar Mountain. It's a very dry area, and there was fires up there and things. And a lot of the things that we taught nice. in the in the plant biology stuff was a lot of the flora and fauna needed fire in order to explode mm -hmm. those seed pods and, and regenerate, you know. So it was pretty interesting to, to learn all that. Yeah, that's interesting. Anything else you've learned that you were surprised at? or? I don't know. We do a lot of episodes on textiles. So uh, I think I... Yeah. Textiles is something that I'm really passionate about talking about. And so I'm always down to have textile experts on the show. But mm -hmm. I think it kind of surprised me, like, how vast the issues are within <laughs> textiles. And like, I knew that there were problems, especially with textile waste. But it goes so deep and it's so far reaching that I was like, we, we could just have a separate podcast about textiles oh, yeah, here totally. because there's so much information. And it's interesting because, like, 
the listener feedback that I get, a lot of people are really surprised by the textile topics and like the, the impacts that textiles have and like how complicated it is to actually find ethically sourced materials and ethically produced materials if we're not even talking about the environmental impact we're just talking about the ethics yeah it's amazing. <laughs> um, the complications are just like kind of amazing and can be disheartening but a lot of those people present solutions as well um, mm-hmm. which is kind of the goal of the show is to kind of be a resource for people in the industry but also general consumers so mm-hmm. it's not just doom and gloom it's kind of shocking i talked to joe di girolamo from Thermore, just yesterday, he's gonna. He was. We did a podcast for my show, and he was talking about the Forever Chemicals, which we'll get to in a minute with you. But mm-hmm. it's just you know, having been on the on the manufacturing, product development, product design side in the industry, and been over to Asia and seen those big, circular, swirling pools of just plastic. It's yeah. like, oh my god, what we got to fix this, you know? And there are some solutions, but man. It's pretty incredible, as I'm sure. So you recently published your second podcast, Forever Chemicals. Tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about that. I bet you learned, have learned a ton that you may not have wanted to know. Yeah, I would say there's a lot of information I discovered uh, that I was like, wow, it would have been nice to never have learned that. But <laughs> Yeah, but that's the, only way you can, that's the only way you can do anything about it is learn about it. That's true. Absolutely. Yeah. And that one came about because for people who don't know, Forever Chemicals are the chemical class PFAS, PFAS, which is per and polyfluoral alkali substances. Thanks for clarifying that. And they're called forever chemicals because they last forever. They have the strongest carbon fluorine bond or like bond of any kind in organic chemistry. And so they are extremely durable, which is why they're widely used for things like water repellency in raincoats or most famously, yeah, for insulation, but most famously for Teflon pans. Yeah. And I learned about them because of Teflon pans. Actually, there was a documentary called The Devil We Know that kind of follows the story of this farmer and lawyer that basically discovered the pollution that the big DuPont factory in West Virginia was putting out Mm -hmm. um, in the 2000s. And they also made it into a movie, Dark Waters, like a reenactment kind of movie. And so I learned about it through in 2018 or 2019, but then going to like the outdoor retail show and like other conferences for the outdoor industry, it started to become like a really big topic of conversation. Like, how do we phase out PFAS? Like, mm-hmm. How do we do that in production? And I was like, wow, this is interesting because I didn't think about the impact it really had on the outdoor industry oh, it's until every, I started yeah, hearing about it more. All the products, exactly. Almost everything. Yeah. yeah. And so then I started looking into it and I was like, okay, this is an interesting topic and I would love to share more about it, like specific to the outdoor industry and kind of like how in 2025, all of these regulations are really going to shift not only the performance of our apparel, but also like how industries are handling these types of toxic chemicals. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like the goal of the show. But I ended up interviewing uh, different chemists and environmental epidemiologists Mm -hmm. and producers in the outdoor industry, advocacy organizations, and yeah, a variety of people to kind of like put the Forever Chemical show together. So it's more of like a documentary style. Oh, cool. But yeah, it's so it's it's such a complicated issue. <laughs> it is um, that it is. it's only ten episodes, but I feel like it could have gone on forever. <laughs> oh, you could keep going. Yeah, I mean, I, you you could. There's it's never ending. I mean, there's so many different angles. It'd be good. I'll connect you with Joe. He was. I was just. I learned so much just talking to him about Thermor and all the things they're doing. And it's just, you know, it's it's kind of scary, and it's kind of like you think about you know kids and young people it's like man you just want to give them a big hug and say i'm sorry but because they're not going away yeah anytime soon yeah the the forever chemicals are i think can be kind of like daunting and scary to some people because they are really far reaching they've polluted the entire planet like albatrosses in the middle of the pacific have it Mm -hmm. polar bears on the north northern spans they have it in their blood every human being has pfos in their blood because it has gotten into everything the water the soil our products 
yeah. not to freak anyone out. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, to think as a kid that, you know, when I was running around the neighborhood playing kickball and whatnot, we used to drink out of the gutter. You just wonder, oh my God, what's, what's, what was that all about? But anyway, it's, yeah, you can't, you can't dwell on it. It is pretty depressing. But, but, you know, I think the good news is we've, we acknowledged it, acknowledged it, we've recognized it, and that's the only way to solve it is get your hands dirty and figure it out. So, Yeah, it is really nice to see that the regulations are mm-hmm. really like pushing changes yeah. in terms of like uses of harmful chemicals. Mm-hmm. I wish that it wouldn't have taken regulation and like laws being put into place for yeah. that to yeah. be it because the science has existed for a long time. Mm-hmm. But sometimes certain companies need an extra push. And yeah. I guess if people want to know who those companies are, they could listen to the podcast. Yeah, definitely. We'll link to that. Yeah, I'll definitely listen to that too. Yeah. It's the only way you can solve it. And and there's some yeah. also also some new products being made that are, you know, less intrusive on the environment. So look for those brands too. Yeah. And too. There's been companies around for ages, Mm -hmm. like Nick Wax. They're a really big company for aftercare, and they've entered the like larger industrial market because of these changes. Really, Mm -hmm. is because companies were looking for alternatives, and Nick Wax is, hey, I've always been here. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) From day one. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. that's true. Yeah. (laughs) Hey, would you kayak more if your boat fit easily in the trunk of your car or the back of your car? No roof rack needed? No, seriously. I'm guessing you'll paddle more if you don't have to go through the process. You know, move the car, get the ladder, remove the kayak from the racks in the garage, put the racks on the car, load the kayak, then do it all over again when you get to the water. Get the step stool, unload the kayak, you know the drill. Oru Kayaks to the rescue. They have transformed the way we connect to the outdoors. Oru Kayaks are lightweight and incredibly strong. They fold down to fit in most cars. Oru's innovative origami-inspired living hinge lets you assemble them in about one minute, and they're designed for versatility, able to hand calm lakes, rivers with mild currents, and even coastal waters with ease. And Oru is offering Outdoor Biz listeners a great deal. Go to orukayak.com and use code ODBIZORU15, that's O-D-B-I-Z-O-R-U-15, and get 15% off your new kayak today. That's ODBIZORU15. And that code is good until July 31st. Get on it. Then send us pictures of your first adventure. Now let's get back to the show. Let's uh, talk about some fun stuff for a change. What was, you spent some time living the nomadic lifestyle. What was your vehicle you were living out of? Oh, man. So actually, most of my 20s, I did live in a vehicle. So I've lived in a variety of vehicles. I've lived in like a Jeep, a small SUV, different types of vans. But most recently, I have a Ford Transit Connect. Oh, cool. And so like my most recent trip, I guess, was like about five months. And I lived in that van and went out to the eastern part of the United States Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. a lot of my... uh, car living before that was spent out west Mm -hmm. because of rock climbing and i was like i've never really gone out east like too much like i've been to new york city and i don't know like a couple places out east but i hadn't really explored or experienced the outdoor spaces there Mm -hmm. and so that was kind of like my motivation i was like okay the west is really cool but let's see what the east has to offer yeah yeah it's very different yeah very wet what was uh how did you did you sleep in the vehicle and you cooked in camp? Was it mostly like a camping thing or did you stay in campgrounds? What was that? What was that like? Yeah. So the Transit Connect is very small. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like a minivan to some degree, but mm-hmm. it's large enough that I can fit a full size bed inside. Oh, wow. Cool. You just can't stand up inside. So that's kind of the downside to that vehicle, but I wanted a smaller one just because it was going to be my only car. Mm. I didn't want to have to drive a sprinter around <laughs> right. all the time. Right. And so I could sleep in the vehicle and I had tons of storage and stuff, but I did have to cook outside of the vehicle, which I went to New England in <laughs> December. So I don't know why I did that, but <laughs> that's just the way that the timing worked out. Hey, good experience like, though. Oh, absolutely. And being from Minnesota, I was like, it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and it was fine. There was a couple of cold uh, cooking sessions, but um, honestly, it was kind of nice. And the van is really cozy and warm inside. And I had two of my dogs with mm-hmm. me, so they were able to cuddle with me at night and keep me warm. 
Um, but I mostly boondocked. So that's kind of where you find free camping areas. I think there was maybe like one spot that I went to. I think it was in like South Carolina where I don't know where I was driving through, but I was having a hard time finding free camping. So I ended up staying at the state park, which ended up being really cool. Like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it was, it was a very fun experience in the state park and I got yeah, to. State parks are pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, they have a lot of like cool tours and like experiences people can go on and yeah. learn things about, which like if I was just boondocking, I wouldn't have necessarily had the opportunity, I don't know, to talk to the rangers and stuff like that. Right, mm-hmm. right, yeah. Um, so that was really fun. But yeah, mostly I slept in uh, forest areas. Mm-hmm. And if I was on like a travel day or something, I did spend a fair amount of time in parking lots. So oh, wow. like Walmart or Cracker Barrel, if I was going through a city and needed to do laundry or something like that. Right. right, um, right. Makes sense. Yeah. What, uh, is there a favorite place you visited? On this, that trip specifically? Or um, just in general, maybe. I mean, there's so many places people like us have been to. It's just hard to pick a favorite, I know. I know but <laughs> I don't know. I think I'll just, maybe I'll just base it off that trip because I was like, if I base it off of everywhere I've ever gone, I don't know if I can pick. <laughs> right. Um, but I don't, I really liked Maine. I mm. I had always wanted to go to Maine since I was a kid. I don't really know why, but it has always been a place where I was like, I need to go to Maine. Mm-hmm. And it's absolutely stunning. It's beautiful. Like the people are so nice. Yeah. The food is really good. Even if you're a vegan, okay. Mm-hmm, the food mm-hmm. is really good there. And yeah, it's just kind of, it kind of reminded me of Northern Minnesota, which is mm-hmm. maybe why I liked okay. it so much. Mm-hmm. Like very similar like landscape and like the ocean kind of reminded me of the Great Lakes and it's just very beautiful. All right. What were some of the challenges you faced living the nomadic lifestyle? Laundry, probably. <laughs> laundry, <laughs> laundry, and showering are always a beast if you live in your car. <laughs> right. And really, doing anything is a chore. But I would say, like car problems oh, were right. a challenge, and traveling with two large dogs. So my dogs are not small. My biggest one is he's like a big Malamute Husky, and he just takes up a lot of space. If you've ever been around a Husky, Mm -hmm. they shed a lot. So like managing his like grooming and everything was um, a bit much in a small space, but we made do and the dogs had such a good time. I'll bet. Yeah. But they love (laughs) it. Yeah. Like getting to go hiking in new places all the time and checking that stuff out. But yeah, I would say I did have a couple of moments where there was like one time in South Carolina, I, drove into a mud hole and the whole (laughs) half front half of my van was just like in this hole in this Mm. road and like the the back of the van was up and i was like well (laughs) this is great but it looked like a normal puddle yeah i didn't realize that it was so deep but it was like it was like a muddy puddle so obviously i couldn't see that it was that deep and there was like puddles everywhere on that road and so there i probably could have avoided it but i did it and (laughs) The universe really graced me that day because I was there for maybe 10 minutes trying to figure out what to do. And I didn't really have service to call a tow. Mm -hmm. And this guy, he was coming the opposite way down the road, of course, in a huge truck. And he had a (laughs) tow strap. Oh, cool. (laughs) Yeah, because he he was out there hunting, I think. But he had lost his dog. So he was looking for his dog. (laughs) And so he pulled me out of the mud hole and then I helped him find his dog. And then we, we went on our merry way. (laughs) Very cool. Yep. That was, uh, yep. The the stars aligned for you that day. Yeah, absolutely. But that was like one of the times where I was like, wow, I actually don't know how to get out of this situation. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, what do you do? You have to have another vehicle unless you have a big, you know, pulley or something. You could wrap around a tree. That'd be tough. Wow. Yeah, there's no way I could have done it by myself. So yeah, I, right. most people could. I really appreciate that that man was willing to help me. Yeah, yeah, very fortunate. Tell us about your favorite outdoor activity. Is there one? My favorite outdoor activity? Yeah, do you have one? I don't know if I have one. I would say a previous in a previous time it would have been <laughs> rock climbing. Okay, but I don't do that as much anymore. 
And I would say maybe gravel biking. I do a lot of cycling. I love that. And I do bike drawing with my uh, Husky Malamute mix. Mm -hmm. So I love any of the drawing activities, skid drawing, bike drawing, anything that can allow me to recreate with my dogs. Um, I think I've heard that term. How How do you spell that? Bike drawing? Bike touring? No, bike joring. joring so yeah. joring is like dryland or is like a type of mushing. Um, oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. So if you've seen people that have uh, their dogs connected to the front of their bikes and their dog is pulling, that is bike joring. Oh, and I've heard of that. It's just bike, like the word bike and mm-hmm. then J-O-R-I-N-G. Okay. And you can and do it with ski any jo- skiing, yeah, anything. Yeah. 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 Really anything it's become a lot more popular in recent years as a way for people to get their dogs out but it is quite fun you know if you like if you like going fast (laughs) (laughs) and what if your dogs see something and take off what do you do (laughs) uh well he's trained not to chase things so i just tell him to keep on and he'll keep running instead of going after whatever it is he wants and usually he speeds up a little bit you know Mm -hmm. because he has some pent-up rage against that animal (laughs) and he just channels it into his pulling yeah but it took i didn't just throw him onto the bike there was definitely a lot of training involved (laughs) to ensure we were safe and the poor little rabbit he's chasing is going god you just met me wait what did i do (laughs) he's chasing him down the trail (laughs) yeah Uh, i'm gonna change this next question i forgot to change it before i before i sent it to you i think So do you have any suggestions or advice for folks that want to minimize their impact maybe in their daily life? Yeah, their daily life. I mean, I'm going to assume it's mostly like outdoor recreation folks listening to this. Yeah, this is a definitely, yeah, very traditional outdoor audience for sure. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah, so I would say like mindful consumption is a Mm, really big one for outdoor sports and activities. Like because... Depending on the sport, there can be kind of like an elitist vibe going on. And there's like a big push from media and a lot of other places, like the brands themselves to, well, you want next season's thing or you want uh, to re-up this thing or get the new version. And just like finding ways to expand, extend the lifespan of your products, I think can be really impactful Mm -hmm. because I want to say use less plastic and whatever, Mm -hmm. but I think honestly, if we're buying less, like we're impacting a lot of things because those, those products are not being used. They're not being sent to the landfill. Like for textiles specifically, it's extremely hard to reuse them and Mm -hmm. recycle them efficiently And so if we buy an article of clothing, like maybe new ski pants or a ski jacket or something, like how can we make that last our most of our life, you know? Mm -hmm. And maybe that means that, yeah, you need to reapply a waterproofing agent to the outside Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. your rain jacket. (laughs) But that's fine. Or learn how to sew the patch on or, you know, iron the patch on or fix the sleeve that's torn, whatever, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I love patches on clothing. I think it adds a lot of character. That's and right. it is <laughs> it's kind of fun, you know, like sometimes like something happens, like you damage your pants or your coat or your backpack and you, it's kind of like a memory. Yeah. Um so I think mindful consumption is a big one. If we can refuse to buy items, rethink how we buy items, it's really important. And to start with what you have if you are starting a new activity. Mm-hmm. Finding ways to, I don't know, use the things you already own or find people you can borrow them from. Or if you don't know anyone, you can always rent them and kind of like wait to invest in something because sometimes there's been activities where I was like, well, I kind of want to try that, but I didn't super love it. So I'm glad I didn't invest in all of that equipment. Plus, that stuff's expensive these days, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's bound to save you money. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. So this next question is kind of, uh, I'm going to change it. My, you know, what is your favorite piece of outdoor gear under $100? But let's talk about maybe a piece of gear that you spent under $100, but you only have had to buy it once. Or you maybe buy two of them over the course of it. It's lasted you a long time. It's durable. You don't have to, you know, buy over the course of your life, six of them because they wear out or whatever. Is there anything like that that you have that just you've had forever? Like a, I don't know, knives come to mind for me, but. Hmm. 
Yeah, there's a there's several things that I have bought that I've had a really long time, but they're not under hundred dollars. So okay, I need right. <laughs> I need to <laughs> brainstorm a second. I think it's one that I guess I've bought in the last like five years, but I I already can tell that it, it's going to last mm-hmm. like the rest of my time outdoors. And it's actually a towel. It's the lava linens flax linen oh, like travel that's... towel. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I. All of the the women that started that company, they're amazing and they know so much about textiles, but also like their towels are very convenient. They pack down small. They're like a little heavier than the microfiber towels that Mm -hmm. are common for backpacking. Mm -hmm. But I find these to be far more efficient, especially because I backpack or travel with my dogs, like Mm, the smaller travel towel is like still absorbent enough for me to dry off like my largest dog. and. That's a big deal to me because then I don't need to carry as many towels and stuff. And (laughs) some of those big dogs can use four towels. They're huge. (laughs) I know. Yeah. And like that was one of the bigger sellers for me. Like when I was using it, I was like, okay, these are actually way better than the microfiber towels that I had been using. And they're made from like a more sustainable material. Like flax is similar to hemp. And the fact that it's very regenerative to the earth is a very renewable resource. And it's also like good for outdoor activities because I've noticed that if you're drying off or you have it on the ground and it gets dirt in it while it's wet, once it's dry, it just like shakes out. Like the fibers don't hold on to the dirt. Mm -hmm. So if you're on a longer trip, your towel's not getting as nasty. (laughs) Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. After a week. Oh God, I got to throw this thing away. (laughs) And I think some of their towels might be over a hundred dollars, but like for their travel size towels, I'm pretty sure they're like 40 or $50 or something like that. So those are under a hundred dollars. I'll have to link to that in the show notes. Lava linens. Yeah. Lava linens. Cool. They make some other products, I think. I should have them on Um, the show too. It sounds like they have an interesting company. Oh yeah. You should talk to Mary. She, Mary or Caitlin, I can send them your info. Yeah, that'd be um, great. Thanks. Their info. But their story is really cool and they're very knowledgeable in the, the realm of textiles if you want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That'd be great. Yeah. I'm figuring since you're a writer and a podcaster, you're also a reader. Do you have a couple of favorite books? Absolutely. I'm going to have to throw out a classic that most outdoor folks hopefully have read if you haven't, <laughs> and I highly recommend it. And it's the Monkey Wrench Gang by oh, Edward man. Abbey. That is, for me, that's the seminal book. I mean, if you haven't read that, get on that because yeah, yeah, it's it's been one of my favorites since I was a teen, and it continues to be one of my favorites. There are other books that I enjoy as well, but I would say that one stands out as that's it's just classic. kind of a classic. Yep. and. Mm-hmm. It definitely influenced a lot of my viewpoints and thoughts. I know that Edward Abbey could be controversial, but yeah, he was a huge influence in Same. my early life and like yeah. the things that I wanted to pursue and like his form of activism, environmentalism was very influential. Yeah. Same. I got to meet him and Doug Peacock years ago. What? I was, yeah, it was amazing. I was, I was working at a sixth grade camp at Palomar mountain. I had a couple of friends that were way into the environment back then and, and the early form forming of the Earth First. And so we went to an Earth First rendezvous up in Idaho, middle of nowhere in Idaho, and it was just crazy. I mean, you know, the Montana contingent was around the fire every night, smashed out of their brains, hollering drunk and ignorant, and dancing around the fire. <laughs> it's, just, it's just wild stuff. But it's amazing what those, what those folks did, you know, to help protect and save a lot of environmental areas. Doug was on the show not too long ago. Well, actually a while ago. And it's just fascinating to hear him talk about all the work that he does for grizzly bears. But yeah, it was that book really, I think, you know, set a lot of people on that path or turned them towards that path because it's just mm-hmm. a great story, you know? Oh yeah. He was a great storyteller. Yeah. I mean, his other works are good as well. Like really good. solitaire mm-hmm. and even like his essays were interesting and in how, relevant they still are today because those things were written a long time ago and a lot of the same issues are persisting which is unfortunate but it's kind of interesting the carryover into modern day when you look at all the progress we have made but then you look back and think man there's still so so far to go you know it's never (laughs) 
<laughs> it's never going to be fixed. So as we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to say to our listeners or ask of our listeners? I don't know. I guess just try to be mindful when you're outdoors, when you're doing anything in your life, I guess. Mm -hmm. Everything that we do has an impact, whether it's on another human or on the environment around us. Mm -hmm. And so I think as much as we can, it's good to be mindful of how we're interacting, no matter the space we're in. So we could have more of a positive impact than a negative one that's good and where can people find you if they'd like to follow up yeah so i'd say we're most active on instagram in terms of social media and Mm -hmm. it's at outdoor.minimalist.book okay and you can also learn more about both the outdoor minimalist podcast and forever chemicals at the outdoorminimalist.com we're also on facebook and tiktok uh but I don't really post there very often because it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's pretty a lot noisy. To keep up with pretty yeah, noisy there. Yeah, it's a lot to keep up with with all the social media, like running everything. So definitely, if you want to stay up to date, the website and Instagram, you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter on the website as well, which is cool. probably the best way to stay like up to date on all of our content. Oh, yes, we do have a YouTube channel. I forgot. Oh, cool. Right. Um, yeah. So that one is also the outdoor minimalist on YouTube. Awesome. And we share all of our podcast episodes there mm-hmm. and other information as well. So like some gear reviews, if you're interested in like how sustainable certain products are mm-hmm. or like general informational videos as well. Excellent. Well, we'll link to all that stuff in the show notes. Awesome. Well, it's been great talking to you. I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, I look forward to meeting you at a trade show or in a national park or somewhere some someday. I'm sure our paths will cross one day. Definitely. Well, thanks, Meg. I appreciate it. (laughs) Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Outdoor Biz Podcast. Be sure to visit our website, theoutdoorbizpodcast.com, where you'll find show notes with links to everything we talked about and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss a single episode. And while you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes or spread the word and tell a friend. That would really help us out too. Be sure to tune in every week. And thanks again for listening to the Outdoor Biz Podcast with Rick Sayes.